Good morning and welcome to Algebra 1. And for those of you tuning in for the first time, my name is David Dye. This is my third year teaching and my second year in Alma Bratton High School. Uh, I currently teach algebraic connections and discrete math this semester. Uh, what I want to start with is last week we started talking about critical standard number two, where we're focusing our attention towards the graph of quadratic functions. And today, we're going to continue talking about the graphs of quadratic functions and look really specifically at the standard form and verts, or excuse me, the factored form of quadratic equations. So that's going to be where our focus is. And last week, I left you with a couple of questions to think about as we got ready for this week's lesson. So question number one that I left you with last week are what are the key characteristics of parabolas? We looked at some last week with the vertex form, and so I want to kind of dig a little bit deeper into that idea this week. And then again, what are we looking at whenever we look at these equations and what characteristics about the parabola is then revealed in its factored form and then in its standard form? So we're going to take a look at two different equation forms this week and see if we can't figure out some characteristics about the graph of the parabola that we are looking at. And so my learning goal today is for you to be able to kind of use quadratic functions and their key characteristics to make sense of quadratic relationships. But in order to arrive at this overall arching goal, I want to kind of address it in two parts. So the first part is being able to represent quadratic relationships algebraically. So thinking about what we might be noticing in a specific task that we're going to look at and how we can model that relationship algebraically. And then secondly, I want to begin to develop an understanding for how to model quadratic data in order to make predictions. Okay, so we're going to look at two different tasks today. The first one being the gold rush task, and then the second one being a task called will it hit the hoop. And then as we wrap up each of these tasks, I'm going to provide a summary, and then we're going to look ahead to critical standard number three next week as we wrap up this quarter. So the context for the gold rush task uh, sets us in the 19th century. So Around the 1840s, 1849, uh, a lot of people are rushing to North America because of this search for gold, so the gold rush. And a man named Dan Jackson owns land out west, but instead of digging the gold for himself, what he's doing is he's renting out plots on his property to prospectors who are coming. So the way he structures, the way he's going to structure this is that he's giving each prospector four stakes and then exactly 100 meters of rope in order to mark off their individual plots of land. And then within that space that each prospector marks off, they're going to dig for the gold and then he's going to kind of take uh, some of his share for renting out his property. So he doesn't have to do any of the work. The prospectors who are coming is going to do all that work for him. But the question then becomes assuming that each of the prospectors who are coming into his land want the biggest plot possible. How far apart do these stakes need to be in order to get the most land? So what are the dimensions of the plot where they need to place the stakes? So if you kind of look at this little visual, we've got a bunch of different combinations that exist. So for those of you who are going to tune in on YouTube, if you take a second and pause this video and kind of think through what are some possible dimensions and then play it again whenever you're ready. Uh, for those of us who are watching live now, what I want to think about is that the perimeter, so the outside of each of these plots is going to be exactly 100 meters because that's all the rope that each prospector is given. But we want to think about the dimensions. How much does the length need to measure? How much does the width of each plot of land need to measure in order to get the biggest area? So let's say, for example, one prospector decides, I'm going to go with a length of one meter, and then I'm going to make it super wide, and I'm going to go 49 meters wide. But that only gives him 49 square meters worth of land to dig in. So that's how much space he has. But again, each prospector is greedy. And that's why they're out in California. So they need to think about, how can I get the most potential area possible? So another prospector, seeing that he is competing against this guy, decides to increase the length to 5 meters, a width of 45 meters, and that gives him 225 square meters in terms of area, significantly larger than that first one. Another prospector sees this and then doubles the length, and now he's got 10 meters long for his plot of land, 40 meters wide for that same plot, and then an area of 400 square meters. And then lastly, we've got this uh, situation where I've got 
12 meters long for the plot of land, 38 meters wide, and an area of 456 meters squared. So I want to take a look at what we might be noticing in this particular table. Right, each prospector is looking for the biggest plot of land. And so as we see down this table, the area for each plot of land is increasing in relation to the length of that plot of land being increased. I go from one meters to five meters, 10 meters, and 12 meters, and my area increases as well. But there's another relationship that exists here, and it's that as my length increases, the width of my plot therefore must decrease. When I go from one meter to five meters, my width decreases by four meters. And that relationship is gonna continue to exist as I go from 10 to 12. Another relationship that I want you kind of noticing is with our length and our width, if I add one meter plus 49 meters, I get 50 meters. Five plus 45 is 50. 10 plus 40 is 50, 12 plus 38 is also 50. And those 50 meters is exactly half of the 100 meters that we're starting with. So there's this really strong relationship between these two side measures as it relates to our perimeter. Additionally, let's say I wanted a plot whose length was 15 meters. Well, if I know that the sum between these two are 50, if I have a length of 15, then my width would then be 50 minus 15, which is 35. So I want you keeping that in mind as we think about this question. How many possible combinations are there before we get to the dimensions that give us the most area? Right, so I want to think about how many of these combinations do I need to list in order to get the largest area? Is 456 square meters the largest? What happens when I go to 15 meters by 35 meters? What's that going to give us? And then we want to ask, how do we know for sure that this is the absolute largest area that we are looking at? And so on this slide, what I'm showing you is every possible combination that we can come up with for dimensions in our land plots. So what we see is the length and its corresponding area. I'm not including the width here. Because the relationship that I want you to notice is that if I have a length of 1, if we go back to this previous screen, then my width is there for 49 and my area is 49 square meters. If I have it as a length of 2 meters, then my width is 48 and then my area is 96. So think about what you might notice is happening to the area as the length is increasing. As we look at this table, as our length increases, it's pretty safe to assume that our area is also going to increase. And we notice that relationship on the last slide as well. Right, and that's going to continue to hold true. But look at what happens when we get to the length of 26. I go from 625 for a squared area to 624 squared meters, down to 621 squared meters. And if I go all the way to the end of this table, I'm back down at a squared area of 49 square meters. So what's happening? Well, as I continue to increase my length, remember, that also decreases our width. And so when I'm increasing my length, going all the way to 49 for my length, my width is just one meter. So I'm looking at the same exact dimensions. Therefore, my area is the exact same. Right, and since I've listed every possible combination, whole number combinations, for my length and my width in order to determine these areas, the 25 meters for my length, and therefore the 25 meters for my width, is going to give me the largest possible area of 625 square meters. But can we be more efficient as opposed to listing out every single combination in a table in order to arrive at that same solution? So if we were to graph every single point that you saw on that last table, we end up with this parabola. Right, what do you notice? If we think about the relationship that I mentioned previously with the length at one meter and the width at 49 meters, and then likewise a length of 49 meters and a width of one meter, they share the exact same area. 
right down here at 49 square meters. So there is a lot of symmetry that's going on on our graph. And we can see that the highest point is present here also. But again, we want to be efficient. As opposed to creating that huge table and looking for every possible combination to arrive at this largest value, we want to think about how we can describe this relationship differently. So think back to two slides ago when we were looking at that first table and the relationship between the length and the width. If I know a certain length measure, then the corresponding width measure is 50 minus whatever I started with. If my length was 1, 50 minus 1 gives us a width of 49, and that's how we would calculate that area. If my length was 10, 50 minus 10 gave us 40 for our width, and then we calculate our corresponding area. So if I let my length be defined by a variable x, and then my width, therefore, is 50 minus x, we end up with a graph of this parabola. So here we're looking at the relationship between x times the width, so my length uh, represented as x, and then my width represented as 50 minus x. So their product is the area. I get this graph. And notice how this parabola maps onto every single point that we came up with on the previous slide. And think about what that vertex is going to be. It's the same point, 25 for our length, and then our squared area is 625. So instead of having to create every single combination and listing it out in a table, I can define these relationships using variables and then graph it in order to highlight that key characteristic that we're looking for. Right, so kind of summarizing some of the key things in this particular problem is that when we're looking at this uh, particular task, a square is gonna provide us with the largest possible area. When we're talking about rectangles and we're talking about these quadrilaterals, the square is gonna give us the largest possible area. We know that our side length and our side width measures is equal to half of our perimeter. One plus 49 is 50, 10 plus 40 is 50, 12 plus 38 is 50, which is half of the 100 meters of rope that each prospector was given to start with. But the key here is that we can model these relationships in terms of their side measures, where I can let my length be represented using x. My width is 50 minus whatever the length value was, and the area is their corresponding product. And then that's going to highlight the maximum point, i.e. the vertex of the quadratic function we're interested in in order to reveal, in this particular case, the largest possible area. So the thing that I want you thinking about uh, a little later on after I'm wrapped up is would it make sense for prospectors to come together and join their rope and then split the land? We know that one prospector with 100 meters has a maximum land area potential of 625 square meters. But what happens when two prospectors come together and say, hey, we want to join our rope. Now we've got 200 meters worth of rope. Would you end up with more area for each prospector if they came together? And that's something I want you thinking about. As we transition into our next task, this one comes from Desmos, and it's titled, Will It Hit the Hoop? And so I want you to take a look at this graph with these points and think about what you notice. And you might say that there are six points. You might say that these points kind of line up in a straight line. But what do you notice about it now? So here I'm giving you just a little bit more context. We've got this basketball hoop. We've got this guy shooting a basketball. Think about what those six points now represent. Before, it really wasn't a context. But now, now we know that each of these points represents the path that this ball is traveling. And before we said it looked like a straight line, but would we really use a line to determine whether or not this ball is gonna go into that hoop, right? If I just looked at the line that I initially had been thinking of, our basketball would continue to go straight into the air. But the information that we see here is that our ball is gonna come back down. So it doesn't really make sense for us to use this line to predict where this ball is gonna go. And so with that being said, instead of using a linear model, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a quadratic model. We have enough information to say this is not going to be the best 
model to think about where we're moving. Instead, this parabola, because the ball is coming down, this is going to be the best shape for us to think about. So I'm going to show you a series of five images. And as I project them, I want you thinking about, will the basketball go into the hoop? So here's the first shot, the second, the third, fourth, and last. Right, and think about that relationship that we're describing previously. We're not gonna use a line and say, oh, this basketball is gonna go way up into the air. Right, that parabola <clears throat> is gonna be kind of the model that we're using to make these predictions. But thinking back to the gold rush task, we know that there is some symmetry with our parabolas. We know that it's gonna be equal on either side of the highest point. And each of these basketball shots kind of end at the highest point. So if I were to kind of think in our heads, flipping this and mirroring it, would the basketball go in? Would it help to have these graphs? <clears throat> because now we can use these models and kind of see whether or not the ball is gonna hit the back of the rim, the backboard, not make it to the goal at all. And we can easily see here that this ball is probably not gonna go in, it's gonna hit the back of the rim and it's gonna bounce away. But this shot and that shot looks like it's gonna go straight into the net. And we can use these parabolas to strongly model those relationships. Right, and so that's kind of the big thing here too is that if I recognize how something is gonna follow a certain path, in this case, the path of a parabola, I can use that knowledge to my advantage and make predictions about the future outcome. So let's kind of dig in deep into one of these models. This linear model does not make sense. The quadratic one does. But when we look at the equation of the quadratic model, what information is highlighted here in this equation that describes this graph, right? And this structure, is in vertex form, but it's not the only one that can model this particular parabola. This equation in standard form also describes the same exact graph. So what characteristics and how do these equations describe something unique about the graphs that we see? So if I take a look at the vertex form, right, so the vertex form obviously gives us the key insight into where the vertex is located. Here, at the coordinates 10.76 and 14.8, but what do they mean? So if I look at 10.76, it's gonna be the x value of my coordinate. So what we can see here is that 10.76 is the distance away from the shooter where our basketball is gonna reach its highest point. So 10.76 and 14.8 tells me my ball reaches its peak, its maximum value at 14.8 feet, and that 14.8 feet occurs 10.76 feet away from our shooter. All right, so that's information that's highlighted in the vertex form. In standard form, we are looking at a completely different form. But again, unique information is revealed about this parabola in this equation. So our first two terms, that quadratic term and that linear term, aren't gonna tell us too much in this particular context. But this last value at 6.69, that tells us where the ball is starting. And in this particular case, it tells us how tall our shooter is, right? If our scale here is about two feet, this guy is a little over six and a half feet, and that makes sense. That lines up exactly with where he's standing relative to our goal. So we can kind of use these equations to really understand what's going on with the path of this ball, where it's gonna reach its highest point, where this guy is, uh, shooting the ball from, right, based on how tall he is. And so each of these equations highlight unique characteristics about the graph. So kind of summarizing some of these ideas is that when we're talking about objects that have this kind of falling motion, again, when we looked at just the blue dots without the context of the basketball, it looked like we can use a line. But when we have falling motion like shooting a basketball, the best model for this data is to use a parabola. And again, it really makes sense when we're talking about modeling data is that the more information we have, we can make more accurate predictions about the future events. And then thinking about the quadratic equation in particular, 
we've got so many different forms that each form reveals different characteristics about that arc that we're interested in, whether it's the maximum point in vertex form or whether it's the initial height, how tall the shooter is in this particular case. So when you're thinking about the data that you have and the kind of information you want, that's really gonna dictate the kind of model that you're gonna use. So some common applications of quadratic functions, right? So kind of real world scenarios. We've talked about the geometric application, looking for maximum area. You could also look for minimum areas, but optimizing space is a really big geometric application. Projectile motion. So thinking about sports like shooting a basketball or throwing a football, hitting a golf ball. For anybody who's watched or remembered watching sports in the fall, you can kind of see this technology being used to see how high uh, football is being kicked whenever a field goal is taking place. You can see the arc on a golf ball for how high it's reaching its max point and then the distance in which it reaches. Uh, weapons trajectory, so military use whenever we're talking about missiles. And then an idea that's really kind of big also is this profit model idea where you know, businesses are thinking about what's the most, what's the max amount of money I can make? But the common theme across all of this is that we're looking for that max value, that highest point. And so depending on what we're interested in, if we're interested in that highest point, then it might make sense for us to construct a model around our vertex form of the equation, where we know the coordinates of our vertex, and that can give us really big information, key ideas related to our maximum value. If we're interested in you know, where we're starting, then maybe we take a look at the standard form of the equation, where that last constant term is gonna be the initial value that we're starting at. Okay, so depending on the context, it's really gonna dictate the equation. But these are not the only two forms. We also have our factored form, right? And our factored form tells us where our graph crosses along the x-axis. And this might be useful uh, probably more in sports and projectile motion ideas where we wanna look for where this thing is gonna come down onto the ground. Is it gonna hit the receiver in the hands? Is it gonna go into the hoop? Um, is my target gonna get hit whenever I'm using you know, these certain weapons? So depending on what you're interested in, you wanna consider what kind of model you wanna use in order to highlight those relationships. As we look ahead to next week, we're gonna transition away from critical standard two towards critical standard three. And the questions that I want you thinking about for next week, so what is the meaning of an exponent? This is something that you should have explored in elementary and middle school, but we wanna revisit that idea and think about what it means to be an exponent. And then thinking about what relationships exist when we're using exponents, and then how is the number one related to understanding these exponent relationships. So that's all I have for this week. I will see you all next week.